everyone, it's been two minutes, haven't been raped yet, but I did do a Google Hangout with a men's rights activist, and you know what they say about those guys. Stop playing. Break free from your chains. To break free from your cage. What we don't want to do is go back to a traditionalist world. Hi, I'm Diana Davison, a Canadian elf, eliminator of legal feminists. I'm going to link to a Google Hangout that I did earlier today, just for those of you who watched my last video and wanted to hear a bit more about it. Um, I had a discussion about why the video was done and uh, why I'm not going to be pursuing that uh, again in this video. What I am going to do is return to the discussion of Elizabeth Sheehy's book, Defending Battered Women on Trial. We're getting really close to the end. There's only two trials left. And for those who've donated to um, the purchasing of transcripts, there is a money order in the mail, and this should be a transcript in the mail back to me by now. And there's still money left over, so I'll keep you updated on how much money is left over. And um, it takes a little bit of time to get from the transcript places uh, what the fee is involved, and also to get them to admit that they have the transcript, or to actually go about finding the transcript first to tell me how much it'll cost. So that's the update on that, and thanks for all the donations again. And uh, so today's case is that of Margaret Ann Mallet. In March 23rd of 1991, Margaret Ann Mallet decided to kill her estranged husband and his current girlfriend. She broke into the gun cabinet in the house where she was staying, which belonged to her husband Paul's mother. So she was living with his mother. Um, he had the son go to live with him, but uh, she still had their daughter living with her. And she had five children from a previous marriage who she didn't really talk to anymore or have any association with anymore. Um, that plays into uh, her defense a little bit later. So she breaks into the cabinet and she takes out a gun and she arranged for Paul to come pick her up and presumably take her to um, buy groceries and stop at a clinic for her to get some medications. Now, Margaret was doing something called double doctoring. So she was going to multiple doctors and getting them to prescribe her pills that overlapped. And she was giving some of them, she claims, to Paul because he was a drug dealer at the time. He was also a police informant. And uh, he had a rather sketchy history. But in this particular case, uh, her story that Paul was forcing her to get pills for him to sell for his own benefit is absolute bullshit. Because one of the reasons she claims he was mad at her when all this goes down is that he told her the clinic was going to be closed and she'd insisted that it wouldn't be. So she's claimed that he was making her go there to get pills for him when in fact she admits and tells us that he knew the place was going to be closed. So she brings a gun with her and when she set up this um, trip she thought that he would bring his girlfriend because she claims he was flaunting his new 20-something girlfriend in front of her. She was in her late 40s, as was Paul. And uh, that when she phoned his trailer house where he was living with this girl, Carrie, um, she was really pissed off that Carrie answered the phone. She's like, oh, aren't you coming? And she's like, no, I didn't feel like it. So already partially foiled, Margaret gets in the car, and uh, when they arrive at the clinic, she shoots him six times. She claimed that she got out and that when she was returning and the place was closed, he was angry and getting out of the car. This is, again, this absolute bullshit because one of those shots was fired, uh, forensically they determined, from the passenger side seat at very close range into his forehead. And then there were another five bullets delivered. He had a seat belt on when they discovered the body and they couldn't open the driver's side door. And there was blood spattered on the driver's side window. And uh, she must have been a really freaking good shot because there wasn't a single bullet that hit the car. Every shot fired went into his body. So she kills Paul, and then because she can't kill them both in the same place, she's at a real disadvantage. She's now got to call a cab, take a cab to the girlfriend's trailer, and, um, and finish out the murder. So um, she's telling the driver to hurry up on her way because... She also decided that it would be a good idea to call her daughter and say, yeah, I just shot your dad. Her daughter's now freaking out, going, you're not my mother. And, uh, and so she's in a weird state because before she did this uh, act, she swallowed a bunch of pills, you know, plausible deniability. I didn't know what I was doing. And that's part of her claim in the trial. When she gets out to the trailer, this, like, blonde bimbo, who apparently had a thing for dating older men and such, uh, 
earns a little bit of respect for me because Margaret showed up there, went into the trailer, pulled out the gun, shot her finger off, Carrie's finger off, um, when she began the assault, and then shortly afterward fired a gun that went into, like, behind Carrie's ear and out the back of her skull. And uh, then the gun jammed after that, so... Carrie's now been shot twice, missing a finger, got a, a bullet through her, her head, and um, Margaret says, oh, don't worry, I'm not going to hurt you, and then grabs a knife from the kitchen and starts stabbing her, chasing her around the house. Carrie manages to get herself into the bedroom, partially shut the door, Margaret's stabbing at her through the door. It's like a total psycho mode. And then uh, she man ends up back out in the kitchen again, or like in the, the living area of the house, and uh, she's got this psycho chick still stabbing at her she and she Carrie puts her fingers into Margaret's eyes and successfully gouges her eyes with it and Margaret's going oh stop that and she's like these fingers aren't going anywhere until you give me that knife so she gets the knife from Margaret now Margaret grabs a bottle and smashes it over Carrie's head and ends up Margaret's wounded enough that she passes out she's exhausted and falls on the ground so Carrie manages to escape from the building the cab driver in the meantime has phone dispatch going oh my god, there's some strange shit going on in this place, and the dispatch, this is really great actually, tells them to get the hell out of there, and they're sending the police. Nice to see the cab company protecting their drivers. And uh, so when the police arrive, they find Margaret on the floor. She's actually called 911 herself and said, I'm on the floor in a pool of blood, and it's totally my fault. And I tried to kill somebody, and I think I killed my husband. I think she actually asserted that she killed her husband, but at some point she starts pretending she doesn't know if he's dead or not. So, in the trial, Margaret's lawyer uses three defenses, because he wants to cover all grounds. He says, well, she's intoxicated. The uh, pills that she took didn't show up on a toxicology screening, so there was actually no evidence that she was intoxicated. One of the things she took is a pill called Halcyon, which um, Carla Homolka actually used Halcyon a lot in her... Um, fiascos of drugging women and, and helping her husband, Paul Bernardo, rape and, and murder them. So Halcyon, one of the reasons that the Bernardo and Homolka cases used it was because it doesn't show up in, in uh, toxicology screenings, and this is what uh, Mallet claims that she had taken a bunch of, as well as a bunch of other stuff. But essentially she swallowed a bunch of pills after she'd already obtained the gun and had set up this, this um, trip out to the grocery store and the clinic. So she's got uh, intoxication as one of her defenses and provocation. Now the interesting thing about the provocation defense that as she tried to use it here is that she didn't just want to say that Paul had provoked her. She claimed that he tried to strangle her in the car or something. But she actually tried to use that, or her lawyer tried to use this to explain the attempted murder of Carrie who miraculously, miraculously survived. I really got to hand it to this chick that she came out of that alive missing a finger and pretty scarred up, stabbed in the face and stuff like that, but, but she did live. And, uh, but Margaret's trying to say, her lawyer is trying to say, that Carrie was an extension of Paul's abuse, that Paul flaunted his relationship with her in front of Margaret as part of the provocation. And so um, her assault on Carrie, this um, you know, young girl who had stolen her husband from her, was actually self-defense because Carrie was being used to abuse her. So that's um, something that she, he wants to see allowed and understood in the court of law as being reasonable. That this is reasonable for women to feel this way and to try to kill non-involved parties because this, this person isn't actually a person anymore. They're just some sort of a tool used by men. And that makes them less human and vulnerable to attack. So uh, justifiably attacked. So they have those two, and then they have just the self-defense of battered woman. Now the battered woman's defense in this case, essentially Mallet goes over, she had like a 19 year relationship with this guy. Over that time period, he was away long enough for time periods, um, quite often away for time periods long enough that things would happen like he didn't send her money, so she couldn't pay the rent and she had to move, and he'd come back and find out she didn't live where he left her and he'd be really pissed off that he had to go find her, right? So that's how much time they spent apart from each other. She claimed that um, there was no psychological separation because he would send friends over to test her fidelity to see if she'd sleep with his friends while he was away. But um, whatever abuse was going on, there were these really significant and lengthy breaks in it. And the story that she painted, the picture she painted, or that her lawyer painted, was basically 
like a frumpy version of the story of O. Now, the story of O is a classic SM book in which a woman is sent off to a training place and then uh, this guy has her sent there and then she becomes sort of his property in the SM context of property and he slowly breaks down all of her boundaries so that she's got no boundaries left and by the end of the book uh, once he's finally broken her and forced her past the last thing she'd say no you're never going to do this I'll never accept that and he gets her to do it then he's got no use for her anymore because his entertainment with her was breaking her boundaries. Now this is a fictional story and um, essentially this is the story that um, that frumpy old Margaret Mallet is giving us and I mean there's a lot of people in the SM scene and you know the, the fictional stories written present them as these erotic and and uh, lusty young people but of course a lot of people of every age are into that and legitimately into that like that's what they choose and that's what they're doing and that's another discussion as I mentioned in the hangout that is probably going to come up in the future. But, um, so she's saying that her 19 year relationship with Paul, he had her so broken through, you know, whippings and, and all sorts of, you know, unusual sexual activity that she was broken and felt useless to anybody except for him. The instigating factor in this was that, um, he said that he, he laughed at her in her face and said, I'm never going back to you. He's got this 20 year old bimbo, so why is he going to go back to her, right? And that when she realized there was no chance left, that that's why she snapped and she decided that she was going to kill them both, right? And ultimately what she's, what she's done with this story is explain to us that it wasn't really a provocation thing, it was a revenge thing, it was a chosen activity in which she said, and one of the witnesses claims that she literally said, um, she's got him for now, but she won't have him for much longer. So it was a revenge killing and it was completely planned out before she took the pills. She got the gun from the cabinet. She put a lot of effort into getting the gun from the cabinet. Now the final interesting factor about this case is that, um, in, it went all the way to the Supreme Court because she got convicted and I'm happy to tell you, she got convicted of second degree murder, not first because I guess she argued uh, the jury wasn't convinced that she knew for sure she was going to kill him when she set out that day. She just was prepared to do it. So she got convicted of second degree murder for Paul and um, she got convicted of the you know full charge of attempted murder on Carrie. So she was um, appealing that and there was one dissenter in the first court of appeals so she got to go to the Supreme Court. In the Supreme Court decision they upheld the decision of the appeal that they were going to dismiss her appeal. But Justice Lohero de Bay, one of our awesome feminist judges in Canada, decided that she was going to give a really lengthy side chat about the battered woman syndrome because it was 1991 and they hadn't had a big discussion about it since the case of, well actually it was 1998 when the Supreme Court decision was making, but it, and at some time had passed and nobody had really been able to discuss and expand upon the Lavallee decision. So um, I'm going to link to the Supreme Court um, decision and Lohero's really lengthy um, sidebar discussion. But uh, just to summarize it for you, I'm going to read a little bit from um, an article written about that decision and how ridiculous uh, some of these Supreme Court feminist judges are getting. So this is from an article written by Karen Selleck in 1998 uh, called A Serious Case of Obiter Dictoria. She explains what obiter dicta is um, in terms of uh, legal decisions at the beginning. You can read that for yourself. So after concurring with the decision of the majority of the court, Madam Justice Lohero Le Dubé was not content to leave it at that. She issued an 1880 word concurring judgment, more than twice the length of this article, only 10% of which pertained to Mrs. Mallet. The court hadn't had an opportunity to discuss battered women since the Lavallee case almost eight years earlier, and she had a few comments to make, even though they were quite irrelevant to Mrs. Mallet. Among other things, the obiter judgment invited the legal profession to get creative with the abused wife syndrome. Don't just save it for cases of physical defense. Trot it out whenever the reasonableness of a woman's actions is at issue. 
And don't be too restrictive about identifying battered women. They aren't only helpless, passive, dependent types. The category also includes strong, independent, assertive, and professional women, too. Justice Leroy DeBay was apparently unaware that lawyers and judges have already started down the road she maps out. In the 1995 case of R versus Lalonde, a woman caught defrauding welfare was acquitted on the ground that she had been suffering from battered wife syndrome. Terrific. Now we have psychologically impaired people being permitted to decide whether or not they'll abide by the welfare rules. We're practically inviting the lunatics to take over running the asylum. And now for the rape joke at the end of the video. Again comes to us from Nefanor. Thanks to Nefanor for all the good material. I bought a rape alarm the other day. I'm always forgetting to rape someone. <laughs>